I don't know if you know this or not, but you don't have to say a lot to say a lot. Sometimes it's just a few words that can communicate a message, that can make the, the biggest impact. It's listening and it's on. <laughs> unless it's muted. Is that better? No. Now you made me lose my place. I don't know if you know it or not, but... <laughs> there we go. But you can communicate a message in really just a few words, and it's a message that will will last for a hundred, even thousands of years. Little examples of, of this, not thousands of years, but if you look at this and you see, turn it on, I have a dream. You can automatically in your mind go and complete what, what he said. What Martin Luther said, we know that his dream was that one day, no matter the color of your skin, we could all live together. We could be just. How about John F. Kennedy, what he said? Ask not what you can do for your country or what you can do for you. Country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Have we forgot that? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Boy, there's a whole lot right there, isn't there? But Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from this earth. That's a good little short lesson to hold on to. Especially now, everything we're going through. Or how about Ronald Reagan? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down those walls. Little short, concise sentences that say a whole lot. Here's a couple more that'll maybe bring a smile to your face. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Yogi Bear, Yogi Bear, Yogi Bear. Mm -hmm. There's a picnic basket somewhere around. How about you don't need a parachute to go skydiving. You need a parachute to go skydiving twice. Makes sense. Good lesson to remember, to hold on to, right? How about this one? You know you are ugly when it comes to a group picture and they hand you the camera. Short, to the point, clear, memorable messages. You really can say a lot in just a few words. Another short, to the point, memorable saying is not the quality what is said. It is the quality of what is said, not the quantity that counts. See? <laughs> okay, I, I know. Before anything says anything, I know it. Okay, Dan, you are, are you listening to what you're saying? Look, I, I just try to make it long enough for you to get plenty of time for a nap. So I'm thinking of you. Uh, okay, enough of the short talk for now anyways. We've been asking this question over the last two weeks and this week. Why Jesus? Why out of the 4,300 religions in the world, why do we as Christians believe Christianity is the only faith that we should follow? 
of all the religious leaders who have ever lived, why do we say Jesus Christ is the only one we should follow and model our lives after? We've been talking about there are three things that set Jesus apart. Not just from other religious leaders, but from every other person who has ever lived. He says unequal life, His unequal death or unique death, his unmatched resurrection. The first week we talked about how Jesus had lived an unequal life. He's the only person who can ever claim that he lived without sin. And no one was ever able to convict him of having sin. He lived a perfect life. Jesus confronted temptation with us. Jesus conquered temptation for us. And Jesus combats temptation with us. Then last week we looked at Paul's reasons why he believed in Jesus' resurrection. Battery must be going low. Why Paul believed in his resurrection. It's the empty tomb. All of the eyewitness accounts and the eternal transformation that takes place in each one of us that frees us from sin and frees us from the guilt of of sin. And so today, we're going to look at his unique death. Pictures remind us of this. There's a death like no other. because he traded places with us. Now I understand I got the cart before the horse last Sabbath. Talked about the resurrection before the death and it doesn't work that way. But yet there's a reason why I did it that way, trust me. Death. Death is not unique. One out of one person will die. It's universal, it's inevitable. All the vitamins and the medicine in the world can't prevent it. It can just postpone it. Everybody at one point or another in their life will ask the question, whether out loud or to themselves, is there life after death? But think about it. Have you ever heard anybody ask the question, is there death after life? No. Why? Because we know that answer. There's always going to be death after life. Even the way Jesus died, crucifixion, it wasn't even unique. There was over 30,000 Jews that were crucified. Jesus was just one of them. So then, why Jesus did, died, and what his death accomplished, that is what makes his death a unique death. The reason he died, the result of his death, is unlike any other death in all of history. It's unique to Jesus only. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter 3, 18 today. We will see in just a few words, we will find all that we really need to know about Jesus' death. Now remember, what we're trying to accomplish with these, this little series here is answering this question, why Jesus? Why should everyone only look to Jesus to have a relationship with God? Why should he be the only one that can make that happen. It's not just that he lived a perfect life, not even that God raised him from the dead, but it is why he died. 
that helps us to answer this question of why Jesus. Number one, Jesus is my permanent sacrifice. Peter, one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus, he is taking us back to the, to the cross, and he's telling us not just what happened physically, but more importantly, what happened spiritually for us. 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins. Short, to the point, clear, powerful. You get that? For Christ also suffered once for sins. Jesus died once for sins. But not his sins. Remember, he lived a sinless life. Jesus died for our sins, for your sins, for my sins. As I shared with you in the first message of this series, there was someone who once wrote, a sinner cannot be the savior of other sinners, just like a drowning man can't save another drowning man. Paul says it better in 2 Corinthians. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In who? In Jesus. Jesus didn't die a martyr. He didn't die as an example. He died as a permanent sacrifice for you and for me. Though crucifixion involved horrific physical suffering, the real suffering was that Jesus died for our sins. What does that mean? He died knowing that feeling of being separated from God the Father. And it is our sins that caused that. But the operative word here is once. Once he suffered, only once. He died only once. The Greek word here for once literally means once and for all, never to be repeated again. When Jesus has sacrificed himself for our sins, it is the last and the final sacrifice that will ever need to be made. One of the last words that Jesus said on the cross, you'll remember, is, it is finished. The word literally means, means paid in full. When Jesus, when Jewish priests were making sacrifices day after day after day, and then that one day of atonement when one sacrifice was given by the high priest, they never stopped doing that. They never sat down. But yet the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, 12, but when the priest, that's Christ, had offered all for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down. Remember what he said, it is finished. The task you have sent me to accomplish is accomplished. He, Jesus, sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus did not make a down payment for our sin. He once and for all paid for all of our sin. He was our permanent sacrifice. And Jesus is also our perfect substitute. Jesus died, but he didn't die for himself. He died for you, for me, for anyone who has ever lived or ever will live, trading places with us. For Christ also suffered once for our sins, 
the righteous for the unrighteous. Did you know you were actually almost named in the scriptures? Not just once, but multiple times? The unrighteous. That's you, and that's me. In other words, you fill in the blank. The righteous for Dan Richards. On the cross, Jesus traded places with me. He traded places with you. He died in our place. The reason why we all die is because of sin, which makes us unrighteous. What eventually kills us in the end is not cancer, it's not aging, it's not heart disease, or diabetes. diabetes, it's sin. Ezekiel 18 The one who sins is the one who will die. Of course, we know what Paul wrote in, in Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Then he reminds them again a few chapters later, the wages of sin is what? Is death. Before Adam and Eve sinned, death didn't exist. It was impossible. But since they did sin, that very first sin, and we took on that sin nature, death is inevitable. We've already established that Jesus was sinless. So, think about it. Since sin is the bottom line cause of death, Jesus shouldn't have died, yet he did. Even though he was innocent of any crime, innocent of any sin, Yet, his body was flogged, he was beaten, he was stripped, tortured, and nailed to the cross and crucified. Why? Jesus went through all of that on your behalf, in your place, for your sins. He is your, our, my substitute. What I deserved he took upon himself. But not just that any substitute can do. It has to be that perfect substitute. Only the righteous can die for the unrighteous. The sinless for a sinner. The perfect for the imperfect. And Jesus is my personal Savior. Why do we need a permanent Savior? A permanent sacrifice? Why do we need a perfect substitute? Peter continues in verse 18. To bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. We need someone to bring us to God. Why? Because on our own, in our sins, we cannot approach God. We cannot come into his presence. We cannot get to God ourselves. The, the word there, to bring, describes someone who has authority to introduce you to the president, to a king, to a ruler, allows you to have access to them. It's an official term. Just as now we have to have somebody walk us into the president's office or whoever. We have to have someone who has that authority to take us to that person's presence. On our own, we don't have that authority especially in coming into the presence of a holy God. Somebody must bring us to him, and the 
only one that can do that as a personal Savior, who has earned that position by being our permanent sacrifice and our perfect substitute. Short, powerful, life-changing phrases. For Christ suffered once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. To bring you to God. And as we'll be sharing here in just a little bit, short, concise, powerful phrases. My body broken for you. My blood poured out for your sins. Jesus is your perfect, your permanent substitute. He is your perfect sacrifice. He is your personal Savior. And if he's not, come and talk to me. Talk to someone. Maybe you needed to be reminded of that today. We live in a world where Satan is at us all the time. The situations that we get into can distract us so easily. Maybe you needed to be reminded of this this morning. And I would invite you at this moment just to close your eyes, to bow your head. And to come before him and say, I need you. Forgive me for getting, for forgetting that you are my Savior. Because you're my Savior, you are the perfect sacrifice for me. You took my place. You were my substitute. I don't know what all that means for sure. But I know this, that you took my sins upon yourself. That you felt that separation from God the Father that we feel in our sin, that chasm. The Father, you bridged that with your Son. And he became our permanent substitute, our perfect sacrifice, to be our personal Savior, to bring us to your throne, to your presence, to be able to rejoice in the hope that we have because of this resurrection. Father, open us. Use your spirit to teach us and to remind us of your amazing amazing love for us. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Why? Why would he do that? So that we would not perish. Be able to have everlasting life. How does that happen? Paul tells us in Romans 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Short, concise, powerful message. Jesus is Lord. And believe it in your heart. It's not just professing it. It's letting that Repentance from our sin changed the way we think so that we think the way that God wants us to think. Believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. The greatest miracle of all is when God sent his son his only Son, Jesus Christ, to bring God and the whole world, which you are a part of, together.
Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection all qualify him to be your Savior, to be our Savior. And it clearly answers the question, why Jesus? Why Jesus? This morning we're going to be celebrating communion. And so that as we sing this, this hymn, I want it to be a, a preparation for you, an understanding of maybe what you were just reminded of, of God's love for you that was so much that he sent his one and only son to be your savior. So turn in your hymnals to 250. Calvary covers it all. Please stand.